it would be a good way to begin by asking the question of what is nature? What is nature and why should we study nature perhaps? Right. I think uh, that's not, that's a huge question, isn't it? Really, when you, when you start to think what is nature, I, uh, you know, I think maybe if we were to ask a person here in the, in the United States, uh, I'm thinking not someone that's trained in all these kind of ecology and resource and those sort of things, what is nature, they, they would probably be able to relate to it perhaps most from national parks where they've gone to national parks, say like Yellowstone uh, out here in the, in the Western US or Yosemite. Um, there are TV shows that have to do with nature as well. Um, so I think that would be perhaps people's experience of nature. And certainly that's, that's a part of it, the, the plants, the animals, uh, the rivers, the mountains, the, the beauty, the beauty of, of nature. I think then as you get more down the path where I've gone over the years and maybe where people who get involved in ecology and natural resources and uh, farming, ranching perhaps uh, as well nowadays, but one starts to, to learn about um, you know, you look across a landscape, I'm thinking back to my own experience. Um, and I, I was amazed how, how much I didn't see until I started to go to college, actually, and study. Um, I was always interested in nature, for certain, from when I was a, a young child. But I became a student, I would say, of nature when I went to school at Colorado State University majoring in wildlife biology. And I'm thinking especially of a class that I took in plant identification. You know, I had walked in the mountains all my life. I had uh, young life up to that point. I had, I loved to fish and I think a little streams I would fish, but I had never seen a plant up to that point, I would say. I, certainly I had walked a good, but when I had to start learning to identify those plants and look at all the different parts of plants from the leaves and the stems and the beautiful flowers and flower parts and to really get into that, for me, it opened up a world that I didn't know existed. I, I never knew that that world existed. And it was just incredibly fascinating and beautiful to me. And so after that spring quarter, I never looked at the world the same way. Um, every, every road I drove down, every path I walked, I was just enchanted with all the plants, all the, all the different species that were there. And I think um, it's that as we start to, for me anyway, start to learn more about um, the parts of natural systems, uh, whether that be nowadays for people and some people in regenerative agricultural movement, soil, incredible interest in soil and the life that's in soil, all of the different organisms that uh, work together to make soil healthy, and then the ways that we inadvertently, through, through our lack of, of knowledge of how soils work, uh, for instance, putting artificial fertilizers on soil can actually damage the life that's in those soils. And so I think learning about the different facets of nature from soil and the life in soil through plants and plant diversity, through animals and the diversity of animals on life on this planet the the literally millions and millions of creatures that make this planet their home uh, i think that to me that is what nature is and then all the interrelationships amongst those organisms and then uh, for me trying to understand 
how how those relationships work and how we can perhaps uh, nourish those relationships or how we could harm those relationships. So, so this web of life that people talk about, I often like to say that plants um, transform dirt into soil and diverse mixtures of plants transform soil into homes grocery stores and pharmacies for all life below ground and above ground. And when we look at the, you know, if we look at the world, there's quite a lot of disorder. We're destroying nature unnecessarily. We're extracting maybe too much. And for me, it seems like the whole point of studying nature or trying to understand it is for us to somehow get along, is to cooperate, is to work together. And how do you feel, what, what, what do you think is the kind of best approach that we can take for us to be sustainable living on this planet and interacting with plants and animals in a, in a way that doesn't destroy life unnecessarily? Yes, I, uh, some of what you just said, I think hits on that point of how, you know, how can we do that? Um, that's a challenging question. Now, uh, when you think about 8 billion people, 8 billion of us on this planet, um, we're utterly dependent on, and most people, I would say, not all, are utterly dependent on fossil fuels, oil and natural gas to sustain the ways that we live nowadays. Um, so there, there are some huge challenges, I think, to to trying to think about how, how can we become members of nature's communities once again? How can, rather than, than kind once of again. dominating those, dominating all of that, how can we become members of nature's communities again? <clears throat> I, um, I think about that all of the time, actually. And you know, at one at one level, it's almost overwhelming to try to think about that with, with so many of us on the planet. At another level, though, what I think about all the time is just where, where my wife and I live here in Innes, Montana right now. What can we do? What can we do with this little tiny piece of ground that we have, acre and a half of ground? What could we do to be ecological in terms of the way that we, we live? Um, how can we get rid of any kind of herbicides and pesticides in our life? And we work, we've worked to do that. We've gotten rid of all those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> one of the ways that we've done that is to encourage the native plant species that grow here rather than planting uh, lawn, which we have a little one that was here when we came, which requires um, a lot of water to irrigate it, to keep it green. Um, the native plants don't do that. You, they, they're the ones that grow here naturally. And so simply doing something like that, um, reducing the amount of fossil fuel you need to, to mow the lawn once a week, water you need to grow the lawn. What are ways that we could, how, how are natural systems working here and native plants are how they were working. And that was fostering life below ground was helping to foster life of everything from insects to small mammals to larger mammals above ground. So I think about that quite a lot. How, how, can, how can we do that? My wife and I are also thinking and planning to move toward solar, uh, solar for our energy in the house to, to, uh, as a way to, to try to be a bit more, more sustainable. So I think in one way, it's about thinking, for me anyway, about how how can we reduce our footprint and how can we how can we try with whatever land we own to create homes, grocery stores, and pharmacies for life below and above ground, right right where we right where we're living. Right, and if we were to look at this on a global scale. Like for me, it seems like what we truly need is just to have our basic nutritional requirements, 
I have to have our clothing requirements and to have shelter somewhere to live. And we also need various products and services. So for me, it seems like the whole point of studying or trying to understand what sustainability is, is to understand how do we extract these things that we truly need as humanity, food, clothing, shelter, and various products and services that we need to produce in the most sustainable way that it doesn't damage other life forms around us. Because we obviously have to destroy something in order for us to survive ourselves. We have to destroy we have to destroy plants to eat. We have to destroy animals to eat. We have to destroy something. So for me, it seems like the whole question of sustainability revolves around how do we extract what we truly need without destroying unnecessarily? And I'm yes. just wondering then, <laughs> would you agree? What, what do you feel? Well, absolutely, I agree. I think it's, a, it's another excellent point that you're making. And to build on what I was saying then, um, and tie in with what you're saying. So if if on um, we have this acre and a half of ground, we've uh, attempted to to convert back to the native plants by simply letting them have a chance to to grow here. But we've also given what you're saying, ah, we need to grow fruit for ourselves, right? So we've set up deep beds all around the the property where we grow vegetables. We grow herbs, we grow medicinal plants as a way to try to, to, to take care of our needs on the place. We've got chickens here. Um, we'd like to get bees on the place. So, But we, we're trying to do that in ways that, um, <clears throat> that don't prevent other creatures from living on, the, on, our, on our property, but that also allow us to grow some of the, the foods that we need to, to uh, to nourish ourselves as a part of that. So I think the, the point that you're making is very good. And then I think it it gets down to, you know, what, what resources does each person on this planet have available to them? And then are there ways to use those resources in ways that, that help to meet the individual's needs, but that also then help to, to uh, nourish and nurture the life of other other creatures that live that could potentially live in the vicinity as well. Sue and I have also planted hundreds of berry producing native berry producing shrubs around our place, and we've done that one so that we can can get um, get some wonderful fruits in the fall of the year from service berries to choke cherries and so forth that, that are local. But that also provides a food source for birds that during the, the fall of the year as well. So I, I hope that's making sense, but trying to think about how to create a, a yardscape that's nature friendly, I guess I would say, that, that helps us to meet our needs, but that also shares nature's bounty with the other creatures that are, uh, could potentially live as well. No, it's it's wonderful to see that you're doing that. But do you think we could explore perhaps if we looked at it like globally, all for all of us, you know, for all eight billion people? And I'm just I'm just like I want to explore, like how can we truly be sustainable as humanity in general? And the reason why I'm saying this is because, like at the end of the day, all we truly need is just to have our basic survival necessities met, which is just nutritional clothing and shelter. And as long as we have those things met, we can do pretty much whatever we want to do with our time, whether it's going for a swim in the beach, whether it's working, whether it's building a business, whatever it may be, whatever we enjoy. And the reason why I'm saying this and the reason why I'm, I'm concerned about this question is because if we truly had all these things for all of us, then we, it means we have a lot of time. And for me, it seems like we do have enough resources. We do have enough energy. We do have everything we need on, on planet Earth in order to provide for everybody. It's just that we don't because we can't cooperate between one another. So I'd, 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 I would really love to explore the truth behind why aren't we living sustainably? Why have we divided ourselves? Why can't we just, you know, make sure that everybody has these basic survival necessities and live? You know, maybe, maybe that's the wrong question to ask, but I think it is worthwhile because that's all we truly need. And then we just have time to do whatever we want to do. And I feel like that's a wonderful solution for everybody. So yeah, that's the reason why I'm asking this question, you know? Um, what do you think? 
Yes, and it, it's a it's it's the most relevant question I think that could be asked, really. And what you're saying of the need for community and the power of community is going to be essential for that. Because take Sue and I, so we'll build on that example. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have enough land right here to raise animals in a way that, that could provide, for instance, protein or dairy for, for ourselves. But people in this broader community do have that. So I think it's going to be of necessity uh, in the sense that you're you're framing the question for us to to learn to work together. You know, I'll tell you something that's coming to my mind. Um, two Please. things. One, um, and I don't want to digress us too far, but I was asked to write a paper recently for a, for a veterinary journal. And when I submitted the paper, the senior editor asked if I would break it into three parts. And so I broke it into three parts, and it's very much exploring what we, you and I are talking about. And it's talking about, look, probably if anything that, that you read is true, uh, oil and natural gas, we're simply not going to have those available by mid-century. So what are we going to do as peoples to try to deal with, with the tremendous... You know, we, we have so come to rely and become utterly dependent upon inexpensive fossil fuels to do all of the work for us. So what are we going to do? The papers are really exploring that. And to not get into detail on, on each of those, I think about what happened to, in Cuba when the Soviet Union collapsed many years ago. Cuba was utterly dependent upon the Soviet Union for oil and uh, fossil fuels. Well, when the Soviet Union collapsed, they never no longer had that resource. And um, I used to show a, a one-hour uh, documentary titled The Power of Community. And it's about what they did in Cuba when the Soviet Union collapsed. And rather than uh, fighting and polarizing and going into, into these different groups, they worked together as community. And so the hence the name, the power of community, they all became organic farmers in a hurry because they had to. They didn't have mm. fertilizers. They didn't have, have herbicides. And so it what looked like an absolute disaster, at least as they portrayed it in this movie, became an opportunity for those people to work together, power of community, and to, to learn how to, to grow their own uh, their own food again. It, it's it was an amazing an amazing story, and I think it's very relevant, perhaps, for what's what's coming down um, as we go into the the next couple of decades. Uh, and and that's where I think the questions that you're asking are incredibly incredibly relevant. How how the last paper is titled "Nourishing Earth, Nourishing Ourselves." Um, and the subtitle is uh, Love as Medicine for an Ailing Planet. And I first had food as medicine for an ailing planet. But I think what we really need is this power of love. How, how rather than divide and isolate and polarize, what a wonderful opportunity to do the ultimate challenge, quote, love your enemies, to, to, to learn to love, cooperate, work together. Um, you know, we often con divide and conquer, right? But, but it's an opportunity to, to really try to think about how we can come together to meet the basic needs that we have, as you're saying. Your questions, I think, are right on, Dom. I couldn't, I think it's perfect to to listen to what you're you're saying and and the questions you're asking I, to me i think that's what's going to get to be very very relevant in the not too distant future if anything that i'm writing about in these three papers and trying to to rely on others that uh, are more expert in some of these areas to rely on their knowledge if any of what's what they're saying is true it's going to, 
we're facing a real bifurcation point in terms of 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 what's what we've been doing for the past century let's say and what's going to be happening in the in the coming decades and so as you say you know well we here in the u.s i can speak for at least we've gone so far beyond what basic needs are has it led to happiness as a society i would say not i would say that it hasn't i would say that people are so busy running running, running, not only the husbands, but the wives as well, just to try to make a living, to try to keep up in this capitalistic economy that we've developed. And I think if you ask, you know, well, are we having fun now? The levels of suicide, depression would speak without even a person saying that, that no, we're, we're not having fun. And when you make your the point that I think is excellent, we would have more time to go to the beach and this and that. And that's very true. When you read in the anthropological literature about indigenous peoples and the lifestyle that they had, which were, were um, much more a part of natural systems. Sure, they, they had some small scale agriculture. Sure, they used fire as ways to manipulate landscapes, but they didn't didn't do in unprecedented ways what we've done to to change and manipulate landscapes. But what was so interesting to read is the the amount of time they had simply to enjoy the time that they're here on the blink of an eye that they were here on this planet. It, that, that's what really. And my daughter and I visited some folks that still had that way of life in Namibia many years ago. And it was, it was a, it was a very simple life in a very nice way that we're talking about that. You know, they, they didn't have mansions for houses. They had what they needed, and and no more. They they were able to grow what they needed. They uh, they had they had animals. They had they had some farming as part of it. And but they had a huge amount of time. It, you know, mm. they did their, did their chores. So it's 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 a what you're saying is absolutely the case, you know. And then then you go back to to where we started. Those ways of life that put you in touch with with nature and with natural systems, how grounding and centering that becomes. And I think um, the, there's a peace that that can overcome you uh, as you. In a, in a sense, come to recognize you're at oneness with all of that, that you're a part of that. You're not separate from it. You, you're, we're a part of that uh, from birth to, to death. And, and that part of that is also linked with the spiritual in intimate ways with the spiritual part of our, of our being that uh, I think we've, we've separated from uh, in some of the ways that, that we've gone in society. So I I champion what you're talking about, you know, the points that you that you're continuing to raise. And I also think that it we may not have much choice in how all this plays out. We may we may in the coming decades be required to to absolutely address the kind of issues that you're talking about, not necessarily because we quote want to as societies, we don't know any other way, but because when, if it's true that you're out of fossil fuels, if it's true that you have to start learning to live again on a solar economy, as opposed to uh, a fossil fuel economy, learn to, to move from ecological to ecological, we're a part of those systems. We we may not have any choice, you know. I, it's it's very relevant what you're saying. And as I've worked on these three papers, I just think about this over and over and over and over again of of the questions that you're asking. And uh, I can't help but think that that I'm happy to see young people like you. <laughs> That are are thinking these thoughts that are 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 wanting to to move in this direction, and uh, 
uh, I think it's going to be absolutely essential that we that we start thinking in these ways that you're raising right now, and then thinking about what are the ways forward. How can we how can we learn to work together? The power of community, as you're suggesting, uh, it's going to be critical to do that. And then, what roles can each of us play as part of that that community in in creating the basics that that we need, as you say. Food and simple, not elaborate shelter, but simple shelter, clothing, those kinds of things, I think. Uh, and again, to circle back, you know, it's not that the, that indigenous peoples around the globe, which are our, all of our ancestors from not that far long ago, um, I think that that they had very enjoyable lives from everything I've I've ever read about those peoples and their cultures. And they moved very much away from selfishness to selflessness, from scarcity to abundance and sharing. Uh, I'm just so impressed. A friend sent me <clears throat> an article that was written back in the early 50s. Uh, he was looking through a place where he used to live in Arizona, his parents' home, and they had kept that article. And it was about indigenous peoples and, and the way that no one would ever go hungry within those groups. It was a shame for that to happen. And the highest honor was to, to share, not, to, not greed, but selflessness and sharing. Wow, what and I've read that many, many times about about those peoples. And you think, how much have we lost as we've moved more to this me, me, me kind of uh, uh, societies and away from community and and that the highest value is to share and to work together. I think those, and how good does that make you feel? It's a wonderful thing, right? To to do something um, for someone. I I recently had a person do something for me um, related to tax tax <laughs> taxes <laughs> and a long form that I had to fill out. We we had given some money away, and I didn't know if I filled that form out properly. So this. Uh, lady who's an accountant I asked if she would look at the form and she did and I said well what do I owe you you know and she said you don't owe me anything and I said okay I'm going to make you an uh, a walnut raisin loaf and I'll bring it to you tomorrow <laughs> and it just felt nice you know rather than everything boiling down to money she did a she did a, a kind deed for me and then to return that favor, but not with money, but with something that that's a gift that that you put some some time into. I just I think those the the indigenous peoples, our ancestors, um, what I've read about that, it's it's just it's it's wonderful and. It makes sense that you would have to pull together as community and learn how to work together as community to to uh, to to survive and thrive in in landscapes as as they did and so i think your questions is right on you know and then how do we how i think it's so foreign to us now i'm a little bit just going on but so I can look out my window and I see houses around and we each live in our houses and we each kind of, we know one another, we're friends, but we're isolated too. And I think this, this idea of how, how you become community, how you do that. I have, have friends that I know who have spent their lives trying to network and to, and to create community. I think, I think that's, going to be absolutely essential as we as we move forward if any of this business that people are are writing about that that know about this uh, is correct you know perhaps when it comes to the question of how do we how do we do this how do we actually change into this this form of living 
because we see the necessity behind having nutrition needs. We see the necessity behind having clothing needs. We don't want to be walking around the streets naked. We see the necessity behind having somewhere to live. And I feel like the only way we can truly change is to see something very clearly. And I feel like just by us engaging in dialogue here, that's in a way us contributing because in a way, in order for us to truly be sustainable, we must work together. And the only way we're going to work together is for us to see the same thing together. And if we all see that everybody needs food, okay, everybody needs clothing, okay, everybody needs shelter, everybody needs some sort of product and services. If we see together that this is, this is, <laughs> it's a necessity to do this, I feel like that will naturally make us change and cooperate. And it's going to be like this natural enthusiasm to work together and that's why i'm i feel strongly about having discussions with like people like yourself with people who are experts in these in these subjects because it's it opens up a dialogue it opens up a conversation and perhaps if we can see the same thing together through listening through understanding through thinking about these things ourselves perhaps that will make us change and to your point earlier you said well then you know some people are going to be interested in doing something some some things regardless so yeah, what do you feel about that? Clarify a little bit what you mean by that last question. Yes, um, yes. Do, do some things regardless. Tell me just a little bit more what you're thinking, and then I'll okay. do my best so, to give you a response here. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I'll go back then perhaps and, and start over. So... I think we can both agree that having our basic nutritional requirements is necessary. I think we can both agree that having our clothing requirements is necessary and also somewhere to live. Now, of course, we can live in a tent. We can live in, in a cave. We can live in a mansion. We can live in a villa. So I think for each of those categories, our nutrition, our clothing, our shelter, there's an cheaper way to do things and a less expensive way to do things and i think the more we demand the more expensive it gets the more pressure we put on ourselves to attain these things in the first place and if we look at the world right now it does seem to me that we're not cooperating that well and the only way that we're going to to be truly sustainable it seems is 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 if if we see the same thing together if we see what is true if we want to work together in the first place. And as long as that desire isn't there, I feel like we're never going to be truly sustainable. So to me, it, it does seem that by us even engaging in this process, in dialogue, in having conversations about this, and perhaps there's people listening, and if we all see the same thing together, that will naturally make us want to cooperate. That will naturally make us want to change. So I feel like in order for us to change, we must see, we must understand something together. And from there we move. So how do you feel yes. about that? That's, that was yes, my point, yes, I guess. That may, yes, very clear what your, uh, the, the question. And I think that's the challenge is how, how, how do we come to, to see, see the same thing together? Mm, mm, mm. You know, when, when, uh, we have so many vested interests, right? In I think of the corporations here in the in the U.S., the the mm. large corporations that have such powerful influence over what happens in Washington D.C. and in uh, the House and Senate and so forth. They they hugely influence that, and it, <clears throat> you know, it may well benefit the corporation, but the individuals that that live on this planet. Um, can often be harmful, harmful for for our our well being, and uh, so there's a lot. Let Let's take not to just pick on the fossil fuel industry entirely, but but there's a lot of disinformation that they provide about, for instance, this whole issue of of changing climates and so forth, and and. Uh, the the roles that that fossil fuels are are playing probably in terms of carbon dioxide and methane as well uh, and so forth there's a lot of disinformation and so this you know you mentioned earlier on it, 
trying to get at the truth. What is the truth? What is really happening? Not so easy, actually, huh? Because we're we're dealing in a way with with a, quote a super organism that has eight million parts to it, eight million of us us people that each in a way sees the world in a different way. And then that that when you get into uh, corporations and and so forth that that have various uh, vested interests in 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 uh, the ways that they use the natural resources of this planet, um, I think that's a that's going to be a big challenge. One of the things that's coming to my mind though that that may be really a uniter help us all to see things the same way is if in fact it's true that oil and natural gas are done for by by mid-century and that their availability we've already we've already probably um, spent far more than we could ever afford to spend on extracting oil and natural gas those resources we've leveraged the future on that so if all that starts to come down, um, say not not mid-century, but in this this decade that we're in now, and in the next decade, that may may make us all wake up, huh? To a to a new to a new reality. I, mean, I think it's easy to live in denial, right? I mean, it, well, when you've been born and raised with a certain way of life. It's the only way that you've known. And if someone says, you know, well, really all you need is food and shelter and clothing, and it doesn't need to be um, extravagant, uh, and you show a picture of what that might look like, it might shock people. You'd have to I'd say, whoa. And you might say, there's no way, you know, that's, and so then uh, you, it's easy for us to live in denial of what's probably coming down. But if these things start to, to happen in major ways, that may be a wake up, wake up call for us all. I think some of the, the environmental things that are happening nowadays, I think are causing at least some people to start to say, maybe there is something to what people are talking about on climate changing and, and, variability in climate patterns and unprecedented kinds of, of events that are taking place. So I think, again, you're, you're right on target with what you're saying about, you know, a shared vision in a sense. How, how do we create a shared vision of, of what's out there? Um, I think that's, that's a really key, key question. And it seems like to me that necessity if these things that we're talking about on lack of availability of fossil fuels, um, if that happens alone, life is going to become intensely local. If you think about it, you know, we're not going to be able to travel all over the globe anymore. It's going to be more about local and community and how you work together. It'll be a necessity thing, but you know, what, what looks like could be horrible might be really a blessing in disguise. If it, if it took us back to a quote simpler uh, way of living, where we became part again of communities, not only of human communities, but of the the ecological communities, the soil, the plants, the animal life, if we became part of that again, we might have much more time to simply enjoy our blink of an eye on this planet, it, it might be a really good thing. So I agree with you. It's important to start these conversations and then to think about what might be a truly bright side to what could look like something horrific, right? It looks like maybe a horror, what, what could be coming. Um, but it, it might be might be inside that horror could be a wonder, a, 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 a way of life that we have totally, totally forgotten about for the most part. I say for the most part, I have a book here that's on my desk that I read a while back titled Hoofprints on the Land. 
how traditional herding and grazing can restore the soil and bring animal ag agriculture back in balance with the earth. And it's about the two billion people on this planet who still live a mostly pastoral way of mm. life, and their linkages with the landscapes. And so, you know, when, when we talk about peoples and the globe and eight billion, we're certainly not uniform in that sense. Um, different peoples are living in different ways. Here in the U.S., we've gone, you know, very much to to cities and uh, and so forth, and not not so much uh, you find pastoral way of life. But but for two billion people on this planet, that's still a very important way of life. And when if and when fossil fuels are coming to an end, they're not going to have to change their way of life much at all, maybe a bit, but they're still still mainly in those those ways of, of living. They might be models for us as well, huh? To learn learn from from other peoples of, of how they how they live on the planet and the joys of, of those that kind of life. And you mentioned that, you know, perhaps a crisis will make us move, a crisis will make us, you know, see the urgency of this. But to me, there's already a crisis. I mean, we have war, we have like, I mean, the Western world, we're, we're living quite well, but there's people out there who have nothing. And, you know, it's already a crisis in a way, as long as one person is, you know, doesn't have what we need, because the way society is structured, to me, it's already a crisis. So it's like, we act now, I know, for the Western world, at least, we, we live very comfortable lives and we do all these things. But to me, there's already a crisis, you know? It's probably not as bad as it could be, but but it's it's time to move already, you know? That, that's what I feel about this, at least. Yeah, I agree with you, too, Dom. I, I think it's already here. Uh, it's mm. already here ecologically, economically, the huge divides between the haves and the have-nots. Right. I mean, many people, as you say, in the Western world live well, but there are many people in in the Western world, in the in the U.S. that don't have much in, in True. that. Sense. Yes. No, I mean, it's it's not so good. They they would not. They would or they would agree with you that that, uh, you know, it's already at a crisis. And I think the populist movements that are taking place are in validating that and reflecting that that hey it's not so good for for many of us huh? we don't have we aren't so well off so the the social the ecological facets of sixth mass extinction um changing climates that's already here right unless we but it's easy to it's easy to live in denial of that because the 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 implications can be far too much to to try to to consider. Um, then the economic aspects, as we're talking, the haves and the have-nots. When you read about here in the U.S., how just a tiny fraction of of the population, less than one percent, has most of the resources here. You know, when it comes to the monetary part. I mean, and then you you read about and you look at the peoples and you go to Los Angeles and you walk around and you see all the homeless people there. There, you know, that's economic, that's social. So I, I agree with you. It's, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you just flat out say it. I think it's already here. You're right. And so, then how how to channel that discontent and that energy in ways as as I think you're trying to say over and over again, and I'm trying to to pitch in too. How do we channel that energy in ways that tries to, 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 to help at the local levels? Right, it becomes very local. Then how, how do we, how do we try to do, to create networks, to work together in, as community, um, to, to do that? I, I just think the points that you're raising are the points that need to be talked about. That that's what needs to be talked about. A absolutely. In those three papers that I mentioned that I, I've been working on, to me, that's that's what over and over again, I just uh, thinking about that all the time. And, and your questions couldn't be better in that sense, you know? 
And then it's, it is about, and I think it's wonderful that you're doing this podcast. It's about how do we start the conversation? How do we start? And then how do we, how do we tap in with people? I'm thinking of people, I won't mention them by name. It wouldn't be meaningful, but people that I know who have worked their whole life to, to try to network, to try to build, to try to build, um, build these local that they've been thinking about that how do we provide food how do we provide food for people locally um how do we provide the resources we we need they haven't been so much on housing necessarily uh and that but but they've thought a lot about food systems and how do we create local food systems to nourish people locally you know there's a there's a lot of knowledge and energy that's out there already right that we we just need to link it up we need to mm all need to link together the power of community I, I think of that over and over and over again i don't know if that's out there on the on the on the web or not i had a disc of that back in the day that i used to show it in this class that i was teaching but it's such a nice inspiring it's inspiring and you know it didn't matter whether you were a phd at the university or a medical brain surgeon or whatever everybody became organic farmers everybody got involved <laughs> And the knowledges and backgrounds all were, were important, but everybody got down to what matters, what's essential, as you're saying, what's essential in terms of housing and how to, to, to uh, provide heat and electricity for that housing, how, how to meet those basic needs, how to provide nutritious foods that we need in the absence of all the fossil fuel inputs that we've come to rely on. How how do we provide the um, the clothing that we need? Um, and when you think hu humans, for for all our good and bad parts, are an innovative species, right? We 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 are pretty dang clever. We're pretty good. Too, <laughs> maybe too clever, but we we are pretty clever. And I think we we really get great when we work together, as you're saying. When what what when when we rely on everyone we when we when we become anti-authoritarian in that sense and we realize that we are part of community and we all have something to offer and provide uh, i think that's that's when we're, we're at our very best i know from my personal experience i can speak speak to that in the research program that I ran for for 35 years, the the creativity that flowed out of that project was from kind, loving relationships, working relationships that we all had, and that everybody that came into that program had for one another. That's how, that's what caused the creativity that flowed out of that over 35 years. It wasn't that somebody alone was so smart or anything else. It's that we were all working together and feeding off of one another. And it created the the dialogues that we had and the and the and then the the rolling up our sleeves and doing the hard work together. All that flowed out of out of out of uh, loving relationships and shared interest, and so it's amazing to see what comes out of that and the creativity. It creates that that space for creativity to emerge. It's it's powerful, and that's what can happen locally if we once again um, can learn learn how to become community and work together as community. I feel like it does it does begin locally, but surely the largest community is just humanity itself, art, you know? Why can't we treat that as a community? <laughs> right, right. Well, and it, it will be. I think it does get to it does get to local because you look, for instance, where we are in the Madison Valley, how to provide shelter and clothing and uh, food is gonna differ from, say, in Ireland or in Portugal. I mean, the locals. If it gets really ecology, ultimately gets very local. It's about what's happening locally, and then these patterns emerge, and then you get globally. You know, globally, it can be happening everywhere. But the way that that takes place, um, 
and that's the beauty how huh? that that's a real beauty of it that that uniqueness and and the and the valuing and then i could just think and for me as i've traveled around the world um looking at, at how different cultures i think of my first experience internationally going to to brazil northeast brazil uh, in the Katinga landscapes and the peoples there and just looking at how how they used those landscapes how they made their living they 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 were still pretty much i would say not not hooked on fossil fuels i used to think when we were working down there we should be learning from these people probably how they're making their livings rather than bringing some of the western ways down there but you know and then you can go to to australia or you can go to iceland or canada or any you know europe or and and you think how 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 community would be a part of that everywhere but how it would become inflected locally of how community works with with the resources in the area that would each be unique to place and and to the ecology of the place just as the plants and animals and and the life there become unique unique to place so there can be kind of this general uh, cultural aspect that we're talking about the culture everywhere and, and learning to work together and then the local in, inflection of that of how how we work together as community here in Ennis Montana to help to help everyone to to uh, to get along and as you said to have have ample time each day to actually enjoy being on the planet I keep saying that but I think we've so I have four sisters younger than me, and last year we all got together with with our husbands, uh, just as a chance to to get to get, to spend some time together. But I just listening to my two youngest sisters talk about how how they don't have a minute to do what they're so busy working, so busy working, and we had a good laugh about that, and we were talking like you and I are talking, you know, that we we. We, we have gotten so much into the materialistic things, the cars, the houses, all this thing, and it becomes the, the tail that's wagging the dog, right? We're running faster and faster just to try, and we're not even keeping up with it all. And then you, you take the, the world of, of uh, advertising, and uh, the main purpose is to make people unhappy, right? You need to have this. You have to have this. You have to have that. You have to have something else, at least here in the in the U.S. And the more you have to have, the the more you're going to have to run, run, run. I remember when I was <clears throat> before we went to Australia for a year in '91, '92. We had built a house, and uh, I had done a lot of work on that house, and we ended up. Um, to go to Australia, we had to sell the house and the market wasn't strong when we sold the house. So we made more than what we had bought the house for. But when you take all that I put into that house, it was a loss. And that really, I felt badly. I felt, I just really bummed me out. And so we, we sold the house about six months before we moved and we, we had to, to get a place to live some shelter right as you say some shelter so we rented this house and to me it was a really a step down it was a tiny little house kind of a dump you know what i would say a dump but after about two weeks a month at the most in that house i felt so good it's like you know i have my family here my wife our two children I don't, I don't owe any money now. I don't have this huge bill that I have to pay each month. And this little house is just fine. And then we moved to Australia into what would have been even a worse quote, dump, tinier, small. I'm trying to make a point. And we were there, we were cooking on an old cast iron stove like my grandma used to cook on when she, you know, I mean, back in the turn of the century. And it's, that was a real waking up for me. It's like all this stuff 
that you think you need on the fancy house and the this and the that and the other. and we weren't living in this castle by any means that that we had built but and for my wife and I both that was that was the last of that we never we never did that again we never built it we, we built the small because it, it was just so obvious how running 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 to try to pay all these bills to try to keep up with it all and then you get out from under that and you think you know this is this little place this little quote dump which it wasn't but you know it's, it's just perfect and the time that that creates then too to enjoy rather than simply be working 24 7 you know husband and wife both all those um there's a real silver silver lining, I think, in in simplifying and simplifying the life. Huh? To as as I I hear, I think you saying of what are the basics that we need, and what what um, in their in their most simple form. I think when I was of the town I grew up in in central in the mountains of Colorado, this little town called Salida. Um, you know, when I was growing up there and looking at the grandparents' generation, they lived in tiny houses, they grew gardens, they had chickens, they had a hog, a lot of them, and it, it was, it was, and they had big families in these teeny little houses, and then I look at my parents' generation, houses got bigger, but still not, the house I grew up, 1,100 square feet for seven people was, is very modest. But we kind of moved away from gardens. Nobody grew hog chickens. And then I look at what's happened since then. Monstrous, monstrous houses. Two people live in them. There's no sign of, you know, you've got huge lawns that are irrigated and fertilized and uh, herbicided to keep out any kind of weed species and so forth. And uh, to me, it's just where, where it's gone here in the West, anyway, in my experience of the West in, the, in, these, in these towns. And I think moving back that other direction could be really healthy for human society and for all the plants and animals on this planet as well. All the other inhabitants that we've kind of systematically been wiping out to, to help them once again to be a part of this planet and us a part of the planet with them. And there's one word that you used in that, which stuck out to me. You used the word obvious. It was so obvious to you that the previous lifestyle that you were living was no longer sustainable, that, you know, it was the, it was foolish in a way for you to pursue that. You, you, um, you said the word obvious. And I feel like for me, that's the, sorry, maybe that's the wrong word. Um, you used the, you said obvious and that made you change. And I'm just thinking, well, perhaps it just comes down to us seeing what's obvious. Yes, I think so. And I think, as you say, too, probably that's starting to happen. I don't know across mm. the board. Every person, you know, I yes. don't know. And I see, and I'll often think about um, some of the politicians here in this country and what to me would be absolute denial, refusal to accept anything that, that we're talking about. In, in some ways, but I I have to think that probably a lot of people are starting to, to think about these things. And maybe th some of what's being talked about is becoming obvious. And, that, and then, then the question, you know, as, as things do become obvious, I think everything that you're thinking about and talking about, it becomes the next the the next step of okay so how do we move forward how do we move forward what can we how can we do that in ways that help um that help to to nourish and sustain our lives and the lives of other creatures on this planet i i just uh, think the conversation you you are wanting to have and wanting to engage is the most relevant conversation that that anyone could be having nowadays but then the question is 
like I think the reason why we why we strive for more and more and more more material goods, more more homes, more cars, more gadgets, more stuff. I think the reason why we do this is because we have this idea of what happiness is. But if I if I truly examined, if we truly examined, I think it, everything boils down to we want this thing that we call happiness, joy, peace, whatever you want to call it. And perhaps it's just our false idea of what that is. And that's the reason why we chase these things, because there's a, there's a short-term satisfaction from attaining these things, but that eventually just dies down. But perhaps if we saw the necessity, if we see that it's obvious that a simple life actually is what we're looking for, as opposed to all of these things, would that naturally make us move in that direction? If that makes sense. I think so. I think so. And then I think, how can that happen? You know, how does that hmm. happen? How does is that happen? anybody yes. gonna gonna change just because? You know, just because. I think we don't tend to change just because it's a good thing. I think a lot of times, necessity does become the mother of of recreation. Hmm. How we could say of how we recreate ourselves, and then, um, you know, and it probably can happen in different ways for each of us. I was using that example of selling that house, and and then. You know, just the way the awakening that took place. Oh my gosh, it's such a relief, and and that wasn't leading to happiness at all. None of that was leading to happiness. Um, it's it becomes, in a sense, too. I think a spiritual journey of that of moving away from all of the materialistic parts of life that we think, uh, you know. And you think of society, and I mentioned advertising and, and corporations and economies, economies that, that can only keep growing, which they that's not going to be possible to continue to do that. But economies keep growing because keep people keep buying things, right? I mean, that's the whole idea is you keep you got to keep people and advertising fits in there because you make people dissatisfied. I have to have this thing. And then how do you break out of that? How do you break, what forces you to finally break out of that and say enough's enough? And how do I simplify my life? Um, even to the point of maybe going to live in a cage or like a monk, but you know, you can understand. I even understand. a smaller home, you know, <laughs> right, like a smaller right, home is absolutely. fine as well. No, like it's, it's, it's as, like you said, you, like it, it's wonderful. Yes, absolutely. And I can understand. And I, I often think of that of why, you know why do um, why why do the the monks retreat to this very simple life? And I I think it's totally about that. And so we could each become quote monk like or <laughs> nun like in that sense of simplifying the life. And and you know um, when you go out in the nature and you you simply observe, you you take time to to look at at all that's out there the beauty and i think i think most if not maybe all people appreciate that still it, it's so mm. but you take the time to do that and then if you go and you're just quiet there and you you let all of that that's around you kind of get into you it, it's a very spiritual kind of thing i think it it transcends it moves you the 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 natural beauty of this world and then at night if you look in the sky and you see those trillions of stars huh and stuff it it it, it elevates it elevates you and it puts you in 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 contact with with what you really with what we all really are ultimately and uh, i think the opposite occurs when when we get um, addicted in a sense to all these things that we think we need and as you so well said you know sure you get a short-term buzz out of getting you know you buy the next thing and oh isn't that nice and then you but you you know you just keep and do you ever find happiness in that no or 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 joy and and peace the peace that the peace the peace that can come, the deep sense of peace that can come when you move away from all of that and into into uh, into simpler way way of living. I think uh, nothing more important than that. Uh, I think uh, for 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 a life 
that becomes incredibly fulfilling and for a life that links our our physical moment on this planet with our 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 eternal spiritual part of of who who we are i think that i think you you become linked back with that whereas the opposite happens when when you're going 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 constantly And it seems to me that that's the whole point of studying nature in the first place. I know ecology is the study of organisms and how they interact between one another. But to me, if I ask the question of why, why do we need to study psychology as humans? I mean, not psychology and um, ecology. And to me, it just seems to boil down to that. How do we live and cooperate, you know, with other organisms, which is ourselves and plants and animals? What, what do you feel is the like ultimate oh, goal I, of ecology? Absolutely, absolutely. And when I look at my years in science and studying and stuff, I think what that led to for me was just an ever deeper appreciation of that, of the mystery and wonder of all of that. How amazing, how absolutely. And so you, you could simply, if you have no interest in trying to study that, you could simply look at a flower. You know, you, you look at, the, at a beautiful flower and you think... Uh, so I mentioned that my wife and I are encouraging all the native species around our place to grow. And in the spring of the year and summer, when people walk down this road, they say, oh, those plants, those flowers are so beautiful. What, wh where did you get them? You know, and we say, nature grew them. You know, it's so there's a beauty that's there that we all recognize, whether mm. we studying that or not right that there's just a beauty or you look at a at an animal or a bird these beautiful swans that fly around this valley or geese and you just think you know that's that's beauty and then for me the studying of that just leads you ever deeper into how amazing how absolutely and how much i think we come to take that for granted how we just you know it's been around us forever and that's where i think how can we become childlike again see through the eyes of a child as the first time that you ever saw that and you think back and you think oh you're just in awe you're in awe and then how do we become childlike again and become in awe and i bought a bouquet of flowers for my wife a couple of weeks ago and they're sitting on the table and i was just looking at that flower and i was telling sue you know you just look at that and you think of all that goes into that flower being there. And you can think of all that you know, which is a fraction of anything that, that's known about whether it's DNA and RNA and on and on and all the phytochemistry and on and on and on. And there it's sitting there and it's beauty. You know, and we know the plants have 20 different senses at least. They're conscious, they're probably sentient as well. And so the science for me, when I reflect on, on what it did, that it just helped me more and more to appreciate what ultimately is the mystery and wonder of the whole thing, just how, how incredibly beautiful it is and uh, how awe-inspiring. And ultimately to me, it becomes deep mystery, deep mystery. I, I remember when I was writing Nourishment, reading uh, some of these uh, evolutionary biologists, mathematical uh, ecologists and biologists, writing about <clears throat> how complex cells are and the simplest organisms on this planet, how incredibly complex they are. And they were talking about the chances of life uh, occurring simply by chance alone are the equivalent of a typhoon sweeping through a junkyard and assembling a Boeing 747. You know, so you ultimately come to this deep, deep mystery and awe and uh, and reverence, reverence for the whole thing. That that's where where science took me. And I think, as you're saying. Just being in nature can can take you there. How huh? you're surrounded by that, and uh, you don't have to maybe know anything about how how some of that might work to to still be in awe at at the beauty of all that's surrounding you, and uh, 
And then, as I say, so you look at, at all the creatures that would be around you, if you just, whether you know their names or not. Um, and then in, and then at night, um, you look up into that sky and you see, see all of that. And it just, it puts you, puts you in touch and it, it becomes very spiritual. And like I say, when I was on the ranch working there again, you know, I, I wasn't raised a, as a farm or a ranch kid, but but just working there and seeing all the creatures every seasonally, all the different creatures that that are coming and going, the neotropical migrant birds that come in the spring of the year, and and you're just out there all day long, every day with that, and that puts you <clears throat> puts you very much, very much in in touch with that, and then as you're saying that um, growing your own food, growing food for other people, which is what we were doing on the ranch. We were raising calves for that for other people, growing our own food, uh, growing crops, and that nurturing, that nurturing of, of life from when it's first born. It's amazing. It's a, and, and I think that puts you back, put, can put a human being back in touch with the with the very with some very essential parts of of life and you know for three hundred thousand years that's what our ancestors did right I mean they were hunting and gathering and then small scale agriculture it's only in the last ten thousand years that we really became much more agrarian in our approach and only in the last hundred years one hundred years that we really got on this industrial uh, ag fossil fuel bandwagon. That, that's been just barely the blink of an eye. So we can think <clears throat> it's still very much a part of us, no doubt, if we, for 300,000 years, that was the essential part of, of what it was to be a homo sapien. We're probably not too far away from that. And that's why a kid like me raised in a little town, 7,000 people, but nonetheless, a town could go out there on that ranch, I think, and just be blown away, just absolutely captured. And I see many young people nowadays that moving more in that direction, captured by that, uh, which is very, very encouraging for me to see that. I think uh, the 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 young people are are the are are the new life right the new life the the life that uh, that needs to to engage engage the the current situation the current crises as you were saying huh all that that's been 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 left uh, you know when I look back though <clears throat> and think of what's happened fossil fuels, John D. Rockefeller here in this country that really, you know, got onto oil and those things. I have no no blame for anyone. I feel no blame, no no criticism, no blame. We do what we do, right? We do what we do. There's always unintended consequences. No matter what we do, it's bad for something, right? You were alluding to that earlier. I mean, to live, we have to eat, right? To eat plants, we eat animals. Plants, as we mentioned, that you can make the argument they're conscious, they're sentient, just as, as animals are. So we're, we're participating. We're here. We're participating. So I tried to do that without blame, you know, and without um, without any kind of, of, of bad feelings for that. We, we do the best we can. And, you know, now we're going to have to do the best we can as well, right? And, and uh, try our best with limited knowledge and understanding, but we do we do the best we can. So in in my heart, there, there's no blame. There's there's under, trying to understand. And then all, all the time thinking about how can we learn to have, uh, live in ways that where we show kindness, compassion, love for one another <laughs> and the communities, these broader sense of community that we have and have it. How can we open our hearts up to to that, I, I see that as as a key, the key ingredient. How how do we how do we do that? Love your enemies, right? That challenge. Love your love your enemies. Recognize that in the end, we're all we're all one thing, uh, and uh, we're in the manifestation at the moment. But how how can we 
declare love, not war, on one another and the communities that we inhabit. How can we do that? And that's that requires a transformation of heart, right? At the heart level of how we do that. That then leads to all that that you and I are talking about and, and the, the wonderful, wonderful points that you've been raising about how, you know, how do we, how do we simplify and uh, and enjoy? I, I really see that as I I had to laugh so many times when I was reading in the anthropological literature as I was writing nourishment um, about how much time those people had to enjoy and about how some deliberately chose not to go down this other path because they knew you're not going to have time to enjoy anymore. They had foresight, you know, I guess to. To, to say we have a wonderful a wonderful existence right now and to me it does seem that knowledge no matter how much we have will always be limited in a thousand years from now we're still going to look back at what we know now as quite limited perhaps and to, so to me it, it, it does the, the question arises then why do we need knowledge in the first place? It doesn't seem like we need knowledge on how to love. We don't, we don't need knowledge on how to cooperate. We just need to speak to one another, listen to one another, understand one another. So yes, perhaps that's a point that I'd like to discuss. Yes, absolutely. And when you say that, what comes to my mind too, let's go back to the ranch where, where I started on this path. And Henry DeLuca, he had no formal education at all. Mm -hmm. No, maybe a couple of years in grade school, and that was it, you know. But what he had was a lifetime of participating in a landscape. And think how valuable that knowledge is. So could he tell you about all the DNA and RNA and uh, epigenetics and on and on and on about how, how those plants that he worked with or the animals he worked with grew? No, he, he wouldn't have, have had a clue of any of that or the importance of phytochemistry in our health but what but he he had a knowledge that came from working intimately with those landscapes that goes back to what i was saying local ultimately it all becomes mm. local of how you interact and the knowledges that you gain and that's that's a knowledge that comes to your brain through your hands with working with nature right with without their working and observing and paying attention. And that I think that knowledge has become discounted as we've moved more and more into the scientific realm. So and where you have to prove everything. You know, well, you know, is that is that backed up by sound science and blah, blah, blah. And I think we've done a disservice um, as we've as we've discounted that local knowledge as we've we've moved uh, away from that and i think it's very important to to again affirm how critical that is in terms of of being able to survive and thrive in a landscape that knowledge that comes from from simply being there and then you have that within your lifetime but then you have that knowledge passed down from generation to generation to generation right and it becomes a part of the of the whole mythologies of the people, of the physical landscape, of the spiritual landscape. So powerful. And in any indigenous group you want to read about around the, the world, whether it's uh, peoples here in, in North America, when we lived in Australia for a year, the Aboriginal peoples, amazing, amazing, amazing to try to learn about their, their, um, their culture, their song lines, their their the ways that they transmitted knowledge uh, transgenerationally, um, all of that then becomes becomes incredibly incredibly valuable in terms of local adaptation, right? And then then we become very much like the wild plants and the wild animals that have learned how to live in a particular location, right? And knowing what and what not to eat, where and where not to go, what, you know, all the things that you, that you learn. And so that, as you're alluding to, and what comes to my mind, it, are these kind of knowledges that have nothing to do with what, what you would learn in a lab or in a, in scientific experiments and so forth. 
and and uh, no way to overstate the the value, the importance of that kind of that kind of knowledge. And what's sad is that as culture, I'll speak here in the U.S., but it, I think many parts of, we've lost that. Right? We've lost we've lost that kind of knowledge and that intimate relationships with landscapes. And what's what was sad to read, and I, I, I was just reading about the Maasai in Africa and their uh, pastoralists, and they, they're phenomenal at herding uh, livestock around landscapes. But the article I was reading was about how valuable that is in terms of reducing predation by lions and helping them to be able to live in harmony with mm -hmm. the lions because of the way that they, you know, so there's, there's an incredible benefit. But what they, they were talking about is that the young people were moving away from that kind of lifestyle. And so that knowledge was being lost. And I read mm. that over and over again in some of these um, <clears throat> pastoral societies, societies that had remained close, the allure, the allure of the Western way and all the things was was catching them and they were they were losing that that knowledge of all of um you know you take some of those people they would be maybe what 300 i was reading 300 plants in their landscape they know of all their different uses for for um not only for food for medicine for um building structures for you know for how to make a living in an environment and when you lose that knowledge, you don't get it back just like that, right? You it it takes time then, and so uh, going back to what we talked about, some of the peoples that aren't so far away from that don't have so far to go if they just stick with that that knowledge that they've acquired. Some of us though have a long ways to go. We we've gotten so far away from that. I mean, you put put people out on on a landscape and. Uh, so, you know, we just need to have a simple life, <laughs> a smaller house and grow our own food and those kind of things. And they would be lost at first. But the good thing is we can learn, right? We can learn, we can relearn. And as you say, too, I know you meant it in perhaps a little bit different sense of, you know, no one knows all there is to know about any particular topic. And you say this all the time when I was teaching, come back in 50 years and what we're talking about now, people are going to say, boy, they were so naive in those days. So it's like that kind of knowledge could go on endlessly. Um, so so we we need to think about then um, this, this local knowledge that has little or nothing to do with, with all the, the details of things, but that has to do with relationships, relationships with environments, uh, with one another, love, as you say, community, power of community, with the environments that we inhabit, the plant and animal communities that, that we're a part of. And that's that's uh, that's probably the most fundamental kind of knowledge that, that we can have and that we're gonna need to regain, I think, as, as we, that's where it's, I think, nice. You're, you mentioned that you're going to be working on organic farms, right, for the next few months. I mean, that's fabulous because that's how you gain that, right? You get out there and and you start working, working with your hands. And then, you know, like for me on the ranch, Henry had a lifetime and he had, that was built on his father's lifetime and stuff. And so, you can learn, you can learn a great deal from those peoples. Does it mean that you always have to do things quote the same way? No systems change, huh? Or the, the ecological systems are constantly changing. So, so we have to constantly be in that mode of, 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 of changing and transforming, transforming, transforming. But the, the knowledge that doesn't discount that knowledge uh, as, foundational in terms of being transformational and transforming as environments change if that makes any sense i don't know but and i also think that when it comes to knowledge perhaps it's just about asking the right kind of question and when you ask the right kind of question the knowledge will just present itself by the kind of questions you give 
What, what do you feel about that? Absolutely. Absolutely the case. And if you think about <clears throat> people in landscapes before the 17th century and science as we know it came to be, they were asking questions of landscapes. They, they were asking questions, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you, you don't have to be in a lab or in some pens or something to, to ask questions of plants and animals, but you have to become a very good observer, right? Observer of nature. And then maybe you do something out there and you see, well, how do, how do the plants and animals respond to that? And so I think that's, that's probably a pretty, pretty uh, wonderful thing that humans, I think, do by the nature, how, by the, by the nature of the, of the, the human is that, you know, observing and, uh, pondering, asking questions of in, in, in our own ways, just as a result of being in, in, out in nature. I used to, when I was doing lots of workshops about the work that we did, which was really behavioral ecology, what causes plants and animals to behave in the ways that they do? What, what, what causes that? And I used to, to tell people, you know, that really, we, we did tons of, it, of controlled experiments to try to ask those questions, but you can be doing that every day that you're out in nature of you just asking questions and looking at what happens, observing, observing, observing. And I think maybe that, that comes easier for some people than, than others. I'm not sure, but I think what, what, causes that is is just a fascination if you're absolutely fascinated with the natural mm. world you do that naturally right i mean you're not nobody's telling you it's just you're just so blown away by how amazing it is that you want to be involved you want to be out there looking observing and seeing what creatures do and if this happens what do they do if that happens what do they do what what's going what's happening with the plants the animals the the natural environment I found that point really interesting because you, like you, like all your life, you, you're pretty much studying nature, understanding nature, but that interest was there since you were a child. And for me, it seems like maybe perhaps it's like whatever you have an interest in, well, whatever you have an interest in, you're obviously going to learn about it. You're going to explore it. You're going to want to understand it. And in your case, it was nature for somebody else. It might be basketball, such as Michael Jordan. I don't know. So I feel like, it's interesting for us to discover what is our unique interest and then to naturally follow that because the right kind of questions will just occur, right? Absolutely, absolutely. That's where I say all the time, you know, is it, nobody can tell you that either, right? It's in you. Mm. You're the mm, only one mm. that knows that mm. as part of your journey. I think the journey on the planet and the spiritual journey. So so no one can tell you that. You just have to look inside. What is it that really does it for me and comes back to? So imagine that <clears throat> post-fossil fuel, we're, we're all living much more locally and so forth and so on. But the power of community, each one will still have that as a part of them, right? And something that can be contributed. We're, we are all different. No, no two creatures have ever been alike on this planet, which is amazing to think about that too. But um, so there's ways that we can can each contribute, right? Whether you're a Michael Jordan or uh, a Dom or a Nancy or whoever it is, you know, the, there's plenty of roles to be played within community, I think, and uh, ways to, to be able to, to experience this life in very fulfilling ways that lead to to joy to peace to uh and i think that opening up that moving away from greed selfishness to abundance selflessness that that is one of the real magical things of community and power of community i think and uh, I think the more we've become, quote, independent of one another, you know, we make our money, we we uh, have our own place and stuff, the the uh, the more isolated we be we've become. My wife was reminding me, even 
when I was on the ranch, but in the, the early days when Henry and those guys were, you know, they, they, they helped one another in huge ways. They're, they're, they didn't have all the machinery in those days. They were moving from horses and those kind of mm -hmm. things. When it came time to plant, they all worked together. When it came time to harvest crops, they all worked together. They went from one farm to the next, to the next, to do those kind of things. Big meals that they would serve. Um, to keep people keep people going and think of that think of how 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 much how wonderful that can be uh, to be involved in that kind of, of of community and relationship and so forth and like this is going back to our previous point but to me it seems like that's only going to happen if we don't have this like survival or like if we have our basic survival necessities met, because that, that means we can do more of these things that we truly want to do and discover our own unique interest, discover our own unique and um, what we love to do. Because if we continue chasing, you know, if we could go to jobs, like you're saying with your sisters, you know, you're constantly working, 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 but then you never truly have the time, the leisure to explore the things that you genuinely want to pursue. So to me, it does seem to, to even boil down to that question we explored before, which is how do we have sustainable, how do we meet our basic necessities so we do have the time to, to, to explore these things? Yes, absolutely. And to me, the, the word that comes to mind is simplify. How, mm. how we need to simplify, simplify our lives. You know, I, what, I, what I'm stuck with, as I look around here in the big houses that are all around us, how, you know, how is that going to look as we move forward when, uh, you know, we, we don't need these monster houses, right? But they're here. So I'm, I don't know an answer to that, but I, you know, it's like, how, how is that simplification going to play out? How, where, what I hear you saying and what I think is, you know, to just meet basic needs in a way that that's that's fine. You don't need monster house. Um, you don't need three or four car automobiles, right? You don't need. <clears throat> and I'm I'm wondering how that's going to look as we as we move forward, and how big is the crunch going to be? You know, I, I I don't have answers to any of that. I I think of this book here that's on my desk world made by hand a poignant provocative convincing novel it's by uh Kunzler, uh the guy who wrote the long emergency and he's 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 trying to create a scenario of what it might look like and it, it's it is so different <laughs> you can't even <laughs> My wife read half the book and said, I can't keep going on the book. It's too depressing to read. But, you know, uh, who knows? Who knows how all that will play out? But to me, what we're talking about, the end result and what that might be in terms of a simpler way of life, way less accent, no accent on the material kinds of things, but on, on meeting the basic needs of food, shelter, clothing, and uh, what that's going to look like. It'll, it's going to be really, I think, interesting to see. And you, well, we'll all be participating. You probably longer than I will. But, you know, when I used to talk about all these things in, in a upper level undergrad class that I taught at Utah State University, I used to think, you know, you young folks are going to see all this. I probably won't, but now I'm thinking I'm going to see it too with the rate that it may be happening, you know? So I think it's going to, uh, it's going to be very interesting to, to see. And I, again, I think the kind of issues that you're wanting to talk about and raise are, are the relevant issues. That's, that's what's on my mind anyway. And do you think we could zoom in a little bit on those basic necessities? Because, you know, to an external listener, perhaps, it may seem, oh, this is boring, you know, just go back to living in caves. But I feel like it could be 
a lot more enjoyable than we actually than we're actually aware of. For example, there's if we like if we take shelter, for example, we all need somewhere to live. And there is this, there is there have you heard of the tiny home movement? There's like tiny homes and people living in tiny homes. Like those are really, really well constructed homes. And then there's these things called art chips by Michael Reynolds, I believe, and um, which are also amazing, amazing structures. And I'm sure if people were had some exposure to these concepts, had some exposure to living like this, they would find it wonderful. They would find it fascinating. And same with clothing. I thought about it like it, <laughs> if, if we buy high quality clothing, it means we don't have to keep repurchasing new clothes. And that high quality clothing, we're going to enjoy a lot more. And then when we take uh, nutrition, that's another thing that we all need, nutrition. For everybody enjoys eating good, healthy food, whether it's a nice wild salmon with some healthy greens. Everybody enjoys organic, sustainably grown food. So it's not like these things need to be boring and simplistic. It's actually what we want in the first place. So what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> My thoughts are I couldn't agree more with you, Dom. When you started into that, the first thing before you mentioned that that popped into my mind are tiny houses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here here in Ennis, they're starting to build lots of those tiny mm -hmm. houses. And it, it's what you say. You think at first, well, how would that be? And I remember the first time my wife and I were, were walking around the neighborhood and we went to one of those houses under construction. And it's amazing how neat they are, how really mm. interesting and how much they can put. And you think, you know, this is what my grandparents used to live in. They lived in tiny houses was really what, what they lived in. And they, they, they loved it. And you're right. It needn't be something that you say, oh boy, you know, that sounds horrible. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing how how beautiful, how high quality, how nicely done, but the emphasis on doesn't take a lot of resources to, to do that, right? It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a tiny little house, absolutely. And then what you say on clothing, I absolutely agree with you. And then I think of the foods and the foods a lot. You know, so much of, I think, um, what's happened in agriculture We've had since since the industrial revolution and, and industrial ag, we've had such a huge emphasis on yields, on yields of crops, yields of, of produce, yields of animals. Uh, I could document how, you know, you yeah, how it, it's just been on produce more, more, more. But and of course, part of that was how do we feed a world uh, uh, with all these people in it that people could see coming but but i think what we forgot is that we eat to meet needs and it's nutrients that meet our needs and if we dilute nutrients in fee in food because we're growing for yield then you have to eat more just to meet your needs if that makes sense and you don't mm -hmm. like the food you don't like the food either because it isn't you know, you can go to the, the supermarkets here and most of the fruits and vegetables look great. They look good, but most of them have no flavor, no flavor whatsoever. Uh, all the phytochemical and biochemical richness is gone from them. And so there again, you say, <clears throat> and I could explain in great detail all of that, but going back to your idea of knowledge, your body knows that. You just put it in your mouth and your body's telling you. And then we could explain it scientifically about all the, the phytochemical richness and nutrients and on and on and on. But your body knows that without being told one of those things, right? You don't have to be told one thing about energy, protein, flavonoids, phenols, on and on and on. Your body knows that, you know? And so I mentioned that as part of our revegetation of our place here, the native plants are top priority. Then we, we've planted um, lots of berry producing shrubs. We also have uh, raised beds because we live on a rock pile. It's all rocks, it's all mm. rocks. So we have some raised beds where we grow grow vegetables and, and grow tomatoes and carrots and peas and so forth. And anytime people come and we don't make a point of this, nothing. 
but they'll have a carrot and they say, oh, those carrots are delicious. You know, we can't believe that. The... And the same with the tomatoes. And we're not trying to, to be any, um, any kind of, what would you say? We, we just don't make a big deal, but we, it's just so obvious, right? Mm, you obvious, grow them yes, yourself, yes. you grow good varieties, you grow it yourself. They're delicious. And you're, Yes. Again, your body knows that. And so we could take that into a metabolomics lab and we could look at the 5,000 compounds that are in it. And we could say, this carrot is way better than that carrot from a metabolomics standpoint. But the most sophisticated taster on the planet's right right here, huh? Your own your own taste buds are would tell you that. So it's a great point you were making on those knowledges, huh? That that uh, it's a part of us. It's a part of us. And going back then to your broader point, you know, life needn't be boring at all in that sense of how, you know, probably not going to all go back to caves, probably not going to all in this country. I hope not. To, <laughs> to living in tents and stuff, you know, in, yeah. in big teepees. <laughs> so we might think about, well, how would it look nowadays? And I think your point on smart. That's what strikes me is smaller is better. Smaller is better. And I think I use that example. My grandparents' generation, tiny little houses, huge families. My parents' generation, little bigger houses, but still very modest compared to nowadays. Modest families, seven, you know, it wasn't 12 to 15 kids. It was maybe five to seven kids. But then you come to nowadays here in the States and these absolute monstrosity of of places and two people you know bouncing around in there and you think is that is that the way to use the resources of this planet it takes a lot of resources to do that and then you think no you know you could you could make a tiny house and uh there there you can put a many much thought into how to create that really nice little space and i've just been blown away we bought a whole book on tiny houses actually just to look at the different designs and what you can do and it, it's it's wonderful it's a, yeah it's wonderful it's absolutely wonderful you know so you're right it doesn't it it doesn't have to be it's like that saying here in the states if if you give if you given lemons make lemonade right you make <laughs> make the best of these situations make it something that's really good and yeah, it's, uh, I think, a very, very good point you just made on that, on the food, shelter, and clothing, and, and how that might look, you know, how that might look in the future, what we might aspire aspire to starting right right now, and then what we might be forced to, 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 to be doing as we, as we move ahead. But the, the reason the reason why I say this is because I think ultimately that's what we want in the first place. I know I know when we say food, clothes, shelter, it's very simple, but shelter could be a mansion, a villa, it could be multiple, and that's what we chase. But I'm just saying, you know, that at the end of the day, that's where that's why we go to jobs. That's why we work. That's why we build these businesses. So we can have something to eat, so we can have something to wear, and that we have somewhere to live. And these things don't have to be expensive. And I'm just saying that ultimately that's what we want you know we just want to have these things and then have the free time the leisure to explore to travel to do what we love to do or maybe not travel i don't know whatever people like to do but i guess i, I that was the whole point you know that um at the end of the day that's what we truly genuinely want if we truly looked at it even if you're a well very you know wealthy person or whatever it may be Right, and and at the most basic level, that those those are very important needs, right? Goes, mm, mm, goes to, mm. uh, fundamental to to being able to survive. That you have mm. have the shelter and the food and the and the clothing, and then, in my mind, it becomes when when does it when does it become far more than what you need in order to to have uh, to meet those needs and and move into into something that's that's so excessive that you spend most of your time working just to try to to have this big house and so forth and so on. Hmm. Well, look, Fred, I'm just trying to think. I think we covered quite a lot of ground. Is there anything, anything else that comes up for you that we should discuss or talk about? 
Dom, you know, I th I agree. I think we've covered quite a lot of of what to me what to me are the questions that need to be asked. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. just to be nice or or anything else, but I think this is the dialogue that needs to happen over and over and over again. And I I'm thrilled to see that you're doing that. You know, I I really am. So I that's what I would say as as. Uh, as a way to to kind of conclude is that I think think the the kind of conversations that you're wanting to have are are the conversations that need to be had nowadays. And I, I think we we touched on many topics, you know, I hope I hope it uh, hope it uh, I hope it did what you wanted to do, what it, what it, that it covered things that, points that you wanted to cover. No, we, we've covered, we've covered everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, not, not everything, but you know what I mean? I, the, I know the, what the, you the, mean. I know the what main, you mean. The main questions that I want to explore, I feel like we, we, we got to explore them. Yes. Yes. Well, I, that's great. Um, listen, what I would say too, you know, that from a positive standpoint, there are a lot of people that are wanting to have these conversations too, aren't there? I think so too. I, yeah. I, I really, I'm thinking of all the podcasts that I've gotten involved in and, and some of the documentaries that are in making and one thing or another. And so, but <clears throat> so, so that's encouraging, right? Uh, that, that yes. Sometimes you can look at all these things that are coming down and my wife and I talk all the time. I think, oh my gosh, you know what? You, you just wonder, really, it, it seems overwhelming sometimes to me anyway. But, but the way forward is, is to, to, to not be afraid, to engage, to, to have conversations like this that, that are going to move things that'll move things uh, forward into into uh, into the mystery of what's coming next huh what what all's going to come down yeah because i think the whole point of having a conversation in the first place is first to move is first to actually act is first to actually do something about it right but it begins right. with a dialogue it begins with a conversation that's absolutely it. It's it. It's not just sitting here dialoguing for the sake mm. of let's yes. let's dialogue. But it. And when I think of the the research we did over thirty five years as a tangible example, it always began with dialogue and trying to think, think out of the box as, you know, trying to think in ways that that people aren't aren't necessarily thinking about, but then then acting, doing, yeah. Uh, moving forward not not just <clears throat> just dialogue but then moving and participating and and doing something about it so i i agree i think you're right on with what you say the dialogue <clears throat> as the as the way to to start to think about how to move forward and actually there is there is one more one more point i'd like to discuss with you and if we're speaking about dialogue, if we're speaking about action, change, it does seem to me that it does begin with education when we're in school for us to think about these things, for us to talk, talk about these things, for us to inquire into these things and to explore these things and even to discover what we love to do. I feel like if there's actual true change, it must begin with education because everybody goes through the educational system and how, we, how our minds are shaped will obviously reflect in the outer world. So to me, it seems like perhaps if we're talking about like actual change in a, in a system, perhaps the most worthwhile change to look at is the educational system, school, university, and so on. What, what are your thoughts about that? I agree with you uh, on that because that is so much a part of, of the way society is nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. to go, go to formal school. I uh, I think that the way that we teach uh, how do how do you how do I say this in ways that <clears throat> sometimes the ways that we we teach perhaps become a bit too dogmatic. I'm thinking from my university level kind mm -hmm. of uh, of working. You know, certainly there's some basic things that that 
a person would probably learn in grade school, even in high school, that, that you just need to know to be a member of society. But I think yes. those need to be evaluated over and over again, too, of, as society changes. What is it that needs to be known now? What is it that we what, that we really need to know? Is it the same things that it was 100 years ago? Probably not. You know, it would probably... And sometimes I think that doesn't happen. At the university level, what I would say too, and this was a real transformation for me over the 35 years I was teaching, was that I moved away in my upper level undergraduate class from I lecture, you take notes, and then you tell me what I told you on a test, you know, that kind of, at least in the States, that's the very you know, I'm the professor, I know, you're the student, I'm going to teach you about whatever it is, and then you tell me back. I I, I couldn't do that anymore. I came to a point where, where I couldn't give in-class tests anymore, because it's like, I don't want you to think like I think, I want you to think. I want mm. you to think as Dom, what does Dom think, not what does Fred think, because that's what you're telling me, you know. <laughs> so I moved away from the I lecture, you take notes, uh, you take in class tests to dialogue. This is what we did in class, what you and I are doing. And it wasn't, it wasn't just we'll come in and let's just talk about anything. It was structured <clears throat> where I evolved to in this upper level undergraduate class were four sections to the class. <clears throat> Challenges, opportunities, living in an evolutionary spirit, transcending boundaries. Those were the four sections to the class. And we talked about what you and I are talking about. Those were the eight natural resource issues. And we would, what are the challenges of the day now? What are the opportunities? So we don't look at it as just negative. How do we live in an evolutionary spirit? How do we transform? And how do we transcend the boundaries that each of us create? How do we open up at the heart level? And there would be readings, there would be videos that we would watch. Um, but then we would have dialogue in class. And I would, Wonderful. Uh, some of the points that, uh, um, some of the key points that wanted to discuss, oh, I would kind of shape those up. But then I would say, okay, Dom, it's your, it's your, your, your job now today to lead the lead the conversation on this to get us started on the dialogue and you never knew Dom when I was going to call on you you know but it was worth points that was some of the points and the students would come so incredibly prepared because they never knew am I going to have to lead the dialogue today you know am I going to have to do that but what was amazing and what was humbling absolutely humbling and it relates to everything you've been talking about in one way or another was to under to realize the knowledge that was in that group of quote young kids i could never lecture again after that because it's like there's so much knowledge that's here we just need a way to tap into it and here was the other thing that was so important about that the kids, the kids, I call them kids, they came from different backgrounds. Some some might come from ranching and farming, and so they're in animal science. Others might be uh, range, and they'd be in range science. Some would be hardcore environmental kids, you know, and maybe fisheries and wildlife. And they came into that class thinking that they didn't like one another. I, I mean, the, the the level of hostility was high from the first day. You know, because it's like whose resources and for what uses and cattle destroy landscapes. We all know that they destroy land. Um, so, and uh, and so if we want to have wildlife and fish, we can't have livestock. And so they they were ready to fight from the first day. And it was the most wonderful opportunity for dialogue you could imagine, because from the first day, what I saw my role was was to create a safe space for dialogue to occur, to create a safe space. And that started when I first, so we'd have introductions. Everybody tell about yourself, tell about yourself. And we'd go around the room. It would take the whole two hours. And I would start and I would talk from the heart, not, you know, well, I got this degree and that and all that. And talking I love from it. the heart about stuff that, that matters. Hmm. 
to start start right then to say, look, what we want to do is engage in in a conversation here, in a dialogue, and learn from one another. And and it was amazing to see how they would respect one another, how they would speak, and it became not just speaking of, you know, I want to show you how smart I am and uh, so forth, but it became speaking from the heart. Hmm. If that makes sense, you know, honesty. Uh, yes, honesty yes, yes, from, yes. From the heart. And oh, we we ranged across so many topics mm. in ways you could never have lectured on that about any of these. And it was current issues and it was rigorous, like I say. But um, oh, and to hear what, what, what would come out of their mouths. And uh, at first, though, it was threatening to some of the students. At first, it was threatening. And on the take-home exams, I would say, okay, review review the materials that we, we covered. And then I would say, what does this mean from a professional standpoint to you? What's it mean from a personal standpoint? That was the exam. What's it, what's it mean? What do you think about this stuff? And if you think it's bullshit, you just say that. You know, if you think it's, a, it was about honesty. And it was amazing at first, some of what they'd write. And my wife's Oh, you're going to get shot. Somebody's going to shoot you someday in that class, you know. But when you would watch the transformation that occurred in those students, you just, I couldn't wait to read their take homes from the beginning, actually, from the first one, just to see, well, how's this? Because it could be very threatening, you know, to, to just talk from the heart and listen to other people, to talk and to listen from the heart. Not used to that. that, that and I had to learn, too. I had to learn to be become very vulnerable to just speak from the heart, you know, not not put on airs or pretenses, but to simply speak, speak from the heart. And it was amazing. It was amazing to see. And some of what they would write. And then at the end of the year, the class evaluations about how. Oh, I'll send you one that, that one lady wrote, but um you know how the world at first seemed so black and white to them all, and then how it becomes so gray in a sense, huh? Of where you come to appreciate the diversity of all these different views and ways of looking at the world and so forth. But see, out of that, then, and my whole thought was, well, like I'd say, I don't want you to think like me. I want you to think. It's you're the only one that has to to go out into the life and and deal with all the, the issues that are coming around. And we talked about the kind of things you and I are talking about, even though that was in the decade of 2000, you know, from 2000, 2010, I'd say would be when I really did that transition. And But the issues are are the ones that we're dealing with now, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones that are there. So, so I think, and I had, Colleagues would come sometimes, friends, and would say, you know, some of your fellow professors don't like what you're doing in that class because they think that, you know, they're undergrads. They need to be taught. taught. And uh, I was far along in my career at that point, and I, I, it wasn't a concern to me of, uh, if I was ruffling a few feathers, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't doing it to be mean, but it's just like, that was the evolution of of where where I went, but uh, and the students would say, "Do you know how mind twisting it is to go from these other classes into this class? How it's just so it's so different to come into the this class." And so I think thinking about what do we teach? What is it that we teach? What is it that students need to know? And you're raising questions about that too. You know. We, we've so accented science in our curricula and this knowledge, this local knowledge from being immersed in a landscape, that doesn't get anything at, at the university, you know? And so maybe thinking in, how would you get students back in touch with that? How could you shape up curricula that help them to gain those kind of skills, that which are absolutely, probably if you have the choice between the two, that's the one you take is the local knowledge of landscapes and how you live in those landscapes and how you work with, with creatures and uh, do that in ways 
So if you could have that as a foundation and then certainly bring in what's been learned that it's it makes no sense to throw that out yes. there's, there's value in that there's huge huge value but when that becomes the only thing that gets taught then then i think we we miss miss the big point so if i were still in university system and trying to work you know i mean that that could take a whole really a whole overhaul of how we teach and then too all the all the different disciplines that are in a university in the end they're all related to one another they're all part of the, this planet so how do you move out of the silos that we talk about that are within university system and how do you create <clears throat> truly integrative programs i i would see that as as the thing whether you're from kindergarten all the way through how do you prepare a person for for society and where society not only is now but where where it looks like things are going how do you how do you do that that uh, that i think <clears throat> but that's where your accent on dialogue i can absolutely that's what that that's what the classes were about for me and that's where you tap into this knowledge that's in the whole group and it it's just uh it's humbling. It's it, for me. It was very, very humbling. I, I never would have wanted to to just stand there and lecture one because I think no matter how engaging and entertaining you are, um, it's boring compared to a really wonderful dialogue where everybody's involved, where you're all a part of that. There's just no way to match that that up. Um, so that there's that part. But then there's that drawing on the knowledges and affirming the individuality of, of each person and having people come to appreciate that individuality and then to think about how that individuality creates a wholeness when you when you when you're all in dialogue with one another, how what everyone has to say. And it was amazing, you know, I, there'd be 50, 60 students there, they would all speak, you know, it wasn't, everybody felt welcome, that was what was neat, everybody felt welcome, it wasn't this exclusive club, everybody, everybody was a part, and you felt that, the energy that was in that room was, uh, it was amazing, and what, what we tried to do, too, was to create a philosophy, not just not just deep, but philosophically. How do we think about these things? How do we spiritually, without ever saying those words, but how how do we think about mm. us as part of nature, of natural systems, of systems that are constantly evolving, moving, changing, um, and creating that flavor? If you look out there on that landscape, if you were here ten thousand years ago, it would look totally different. That this is this whole idea of change and dynamism, and we're a part of that, and just trying to create more than just as I had as a young prop. You know, here's the details of this subject matter, and to me that became became incredibly boring. Actually, it was about about this this other way. So. That's long-winded, but I think again, you're you're asking really good questions, Tom. And that that one to me is really that point that you made that set up the the my thoughts on that. I think is really a crucial one in terms of how we think about all this stuff. And I very much I know this may be beating a dead horse, but I very much appreciate your your raising the point on different kind of knowledges, huh? Different because that's allowed us to talk about well where we've gone from science standpoint and and that kind of knowledge, but then this whole idea of local adaptation, knowledge of local systems of relationships there, um, that <clears throat> is a tremendous tremendously important knowledge that you probably aren't going to learn by going to school unfortunately you know and. As we were saying now, maybe school systems need to be transformed into uh, into a better blend of those two kinds of knowledges. 
and perhaps that'll come as, as we move into, you know, into some of what we started out talking about. It's going to be really critical to have knowledge of how how do you produce your own food? How do you make a tiny house out of materials that you have that 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 work? How do you make how do you create clothing that that's really high quality that lasts for a, a long time? And how do you do that in ways that you know? I, I often think that people love challenges. I think people love the challenge of engaging in an environment of being involved in that environment. I think. Um, I think of some of the folks I know that that are very they're 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 very bright, very creative. But some of the jobs here in this valley aren't aren't so interesting. You know, running a dump truck all day long, filling the dump trucks. I mean, after your first week of you learn that, it's probably not. I think what people love is constantly to be challenged, huh? to be in, engaging their thoughts and. Maybe moving back in this direction could could do that. Plus, as you say, the the leisure time to simply enjoy being on this planet that I think has is lost for so many people nowadays. Too busy working, working, working to try to keep up with all those materialistic things as we talked earlier. Because uh, first of all, I I love the way you were teaching because to me that's what education is about it's about dialogue discussions where everybody's learning together not just the educator there at the top of the classroom but it's everybody engaged in dialogue and i feel like that's when true learning actually takes place in the first place so i really love the way you were teaching that and i respect you for doing that against you know your colleagues because like you were saying it's a kind of a different environment your class compared to other classes so i really respect you for taking the leap and doing something differently because to me that's that's where true learning takes place in a dialogue and a discussion and it's wonderful to see that yeah and it was wonderful to well, it was wonderful to to go down that path but <clears throat> going back to what we talked about earlier i'd reached a point you know i in the late 80s early 90s i i suffered from severe depression like I used to say, I used to have to look up to see a worm. I was just really, really, really severely depressed. Don't need to get into why that that happened or what what happened. But it took a long time to to. I thought it would never end, actually. But it was part of a journey, and I have come to see trials like that. I had cancer at another point ten years later, as really opportunities. They're oppor We would never volunteer, raise our hand. But those trials transform, trials transform. And in mythology, that's talked about all the time, how trials transform consciousness, the way that, you, and boy, the depression did that for me. And I started reading about world mythologies. Uh, it's a long story. I won't go into how all that happened. And just thinking about things that I had wondered my whole life and, and getting into that and uh, all of that, changed the way that I looked at everything in the world. And I couldn't teach the same way after that. So that started mm. really back in the early 90s for me, where, where I started to move move away from that, that one way. So that's where, you know, okay, what's going to happen here? If it's true, no more oil and natural gas. You know, you could say, I see that not as a problem. I see it as a challenge and a huge opportunity, a huge opportunity to live in an evolutionary spirit and to transform boundaries that we that we've created. I, I think that's that's for me. And that's why I ultimately changed all the subsections within the course to, to move to those four, because like that's to me really what it's challenge. It's not problems, it's challenges. It's not that we have to do it, it's opportunities. And it's about how we forever have to transform. How from birth to death, we continually transforming as individual, as society, how we have to transform. So live in an evolutionary spirit. And then to me, that meant transcending boundaries that we always end up inadvertently seems like creating rather than just embracing uncertainty and the unknown and uh, mystery and wonder. And what you say to of having time, time just to 
time just to not only recreate, but to just stop and and ponder huh? and re just just to be, just to be. So we've transformed from human beings into human doings, haven't mm. we? You know, human doings, that being part. And just that, I was with a colleague, we were skiing, a friend, I, um, we were skiing at a small local area here on Friday. And he was saying, I, I just need time to think. I just need, he's near the end of his career. I just need time to think. That that's so important. Just time to reflect. Just time to, and maybe you just go out and you sit there in nature and you're just quiet. You know, you're just quiet. The kind of a meditation. But that time is is invaluable. And when you lose that time, because all you're doing is doing, you've you've really on your way to losing losing it all as an individual. And then when whole societies do that, so I can see. And I try to think and write in this way, this, these challenges that we're facing now, ecologically, economically, socially, are really great opportunities. But we're going to have to evolve, live in that evolutionary spirit. And really, what I think most, transcending the boundaries that we create, how can we, can we, and how can we work together how can rather than seeing people that are different as the enemy huh to be attacked and to be which we've done forever right we mythologies of war and peace it's mainly about mythologies of war is it it is possible it is within us but we have going to have to love and kindness compassion for one another and for the planet but he, that's a big challenge. It's a major challenge our species is facing now, I think. You know, can we can we come together? Can we learn to the power of community? And how can we how can we all work together? Or uh, or will we go down the path that, as you mentioned earlier, we didn't dwell on this, but you know, all the wars that are taking place, what's happening happens happening. Um uh, You know, it's going to be interesting to see, huh? It is a challenge, but, uh, you know, I, I thought about this and every time it comes back to this, to me, it does seem that everything boils down to the inner, our understanding of ourselves. And the reason why we don't cooperate between one another is due to division. And more importantly, this psychological division, psychological division, meaning nationality, religion politics, our economics, and so on, our beliefs, our, our um, ideologies, our philosophies. And I feel like it's this psychological barrier between us that makes us not want to cooperate. For example, war is just a result of nationalities, one nationality against another nationality over what? A, a plot of land that it's just our art. So I feel like unless we understand our own conditioning, unless we understand our own psychological structure, there's going to be no cooperation is going to be no sustainability. So I feel like true change must begin with ourselves and it must begin with understanding ourselves. And that's why I do these dialogues in the first place. Well, first of all, I adore doing this. I really enjoy having conversations and just thinking about these things. But more importantly, I do think that it's important to understand these things for ourselves. Otherwise, there's going to be no real change. Yes, well said. Well said, Dom. A absolutely. I couldn't agree more. The, the transformation has to occur within us, huh? One, one, one person at a time. Mm. You know, I, I uh, you know, I remember <clears throat> this fellow that I've liked so much reading some of what he's written. He's long dead now, Joseph Campbell, mm. his power mm. of myth stuff. But but he talks about uh, there's a quote I often put in presentations of the world is perfect, he says. It's a mess. It's always been a mess. It's always going to be a mess. Um, your job isn't to try to change the world, change yourself. And if each of us did that, you change the world, right? If we each did that, you do end up transforming the world. So what else? Where else? It begins and ends in us, and it's 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 a spiritual journey in in a very real sense, huh? a spiritual journey of transcending transcending uh, names and forms and and what we think of as fred and or dom or whatever huh? it's to come to realize 
that uh, that that ultimately there are no there are no divisions and and to appreciate the differences but that has to take place in each heart that has to as long as it's not in each heart <clears throat> but that's where it's so true you know that uh, in order to transform the world you have to start with yourself right and then everyone that you that you interact with it it begins and ends in here nowhere else huh with each one of us that's that's ultimately that's the last trick is up is up to us we we have to do that yeah i think so too and that's where now, that's that could be a good place to end, but I'll add. <laughs> that's where too. I often think when we were doing all of our studies of animals and looking at how their behaviors came about, starting in the womb and early in life, and how the environment where they were born and raised had such a profound influence on what they, what the, you know, what they what they they became <clears throat> and if you raised one under this condition it it did this kind these kinds of things if you raised it under a totally different place and different conditions it was a different so that was the cultural inflection i used to say right the cultural the local cultural inflection there's nothing sacred about that it's simply a result of where you're born and raised and when you talk about the politics the the religious beliefs how many people have been killed over religious wars huh? ideologies where in the end when you if you become enlightened in that sense that that word is used where you move beyond names and forms to that deep deep inner peace that comes from enlightenment that's where that's where it all leads it's it's a oneness at oneness we we are not separate from from the transcendent we are that we, we, and that's what people wake up to i i had that experience after cancer for for two three years that 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 incredible peace that the the enlightened people write about and that knowing that you never you were never born, you never die. I mean, you can't put this in the word. It's ineffable. Huh? The peace and all this, it can sound can sound crazy. It's not when it happens to you. And when you start reading in those literatures, whether it's Eckhart Tolle talking about the power of now and what happened to him, or William James in, in, <clears throat> in uh, the world's religions, and that ultimately that's where it all leads is to, to that recognition. But we kill each other <clears throat> over cultural inflections. It's all, it's all over the local cultural inflection and it's stupidity, you know, it's stupidity in that sense to realize if you were born and raised in this place and at this time, that's what you would, that's how you would be manifest, right? That's the belief systems that you would be taught. And, and if you can, if you can, there again, I totally agree with you, if through education, you can move to an appreciation of that, huh? And then move to where does that all lead to this from a religious standpoint, enlightenment to waking up to you, to who you are beyond names and forms. So you're, you're, and that this is locally inflected culturally and that there's a beauty in that. It's amazing to see that. But, um, but, that's the scary part is that that we get so and then and politicians play on that too. Politicians totally play on that to rile up their base, you know. Uh, I see that happening so much here in the US nowadays, but it's happening around the world too. It always has, but you know, it's it's very disingenuous, I think. But people need to be waked up on what do what what do autocrats do? They they get rid of the people that woke up too. Huh? It's one of their first acts, oftentimes. Get rid of anybody that's that's woke up to to some of these broader realizations. I think. But even the politician is just a human, and he wants the same things as as does everybody else. I feel like it's just that they need to protect something that they built. But in actuality, if they were stuck on the desert with no water, they would give everything away just for that sip of water. <laughs> like everything away and i feel like that ultimately like that's what we all want just 
our basic stuff to find out what this happiness, what this joy, what this peace thing is that all these people speak about and to live, to enjoy ourselves, to do what we love to do. And it may very well be building a business. It may very well be gardening. It may very well be, I don't know, whatever it is. But I think that's the whole yeah. joy of just living <laughs> is to enjoy. Oh, it, it is. I agree, Tom. I agree. I, I, love, I love to hear all that you talk about and to see your big smile. And, you know, if you ever have, <clears throat> so books have been written, many books by people in the East, Nisargadatta's books upon books and on and on and on and Eckhart Tolle and others here in the West and William James and on and on and on. But, you know, if, if, if you ever experience what, what happened to me after cancer and what they write about, you know, if I'd have just read about that, I would have, I would have certainly believed it, but <clears throat> when it happens, when it happens to you, and as Eckhart Tolle said, for it comes as a result of surrender, where you you let the ego go, you just absolutely surrender. And having cancer, having surgery, all those things, I think, is what caused that to happen in me. You know, just a total, I give up, I give up, I surrender it all. I was running. I was doing everything we talked, running as fast as I could run and too fast. And all that. But that just stopped me right there. And then it was a surrender. And it's like, boy, what happened? Then that peace, that peace that overcame me, that joy, that joy. Tal use that word, the peace, the ineffable peace, the joy, and the knowing. And this is where it all gets so hard to put into words because you, you just can't describe it. And then... So how do you know that you're eternal, that you, you're one with the transcendent? You, it goes to what you were saying. It's it's like tasting a really good fruit, and you know this is this is nutritious. It's there. It's something that's just in you, and you just know that. You can't prove it. You couldn't start to prove it. You can't even hardly. You can't even put it into words. But I often think, boy, if everyone could have that experience there would absolutely be peace on, on earth. And of course, that's what Tall writes about and Eckhart writes about <clears throat> so much in books like Power of Now is, you know, I think that's his, his whole goal or purpose would be to try to help people to, to learn to surrender, to wake up so that, that, you know, he writes about how the mi what species kills so many millions of its own kind just kills over and over again in endless wars what is we're insane he says we're insane as a species we're insane and we're deeply unconscious he says we, how do we wake up how do we become conscious and how do we move toward that and i think it's wonderful what he and others have uh you know attempt to do from their experience of that right he did he didn't volunteer for any of that. What happened to him when he was 29, he'd lived a lifetime of anxiety and deep depression and near suicidal. And, and then he finally, you know, came to that night where he said, I can't live with myself anymore. And then he thought, who is this self that can't live with this self? He said, there must be two of me, you know, and then he goes on, he went, went to sleep. And, and when he woke up, he was he was enlightened. He had he had he had totally surrendered, and he was at, and he he just that description of that that first few pages of the book. It's it's powerful, you know. It it just he was just uh, in in another in a totally different state. Uh, and that state's wonderful because you just know nothing will ever harm you know and you're not in it's not that you aren't engaged in the world you are but you just it's from a different way that you're feeling experiencing the world at that point that's i'll send that to you i've i've <clears throat> copied those first few pages for for another person recently who's working on a documentary i'll, I'll send them to you but it, it's i'm familiar it's, with the book I'm okay, familiar so with Eckhart Tolle. Read. I've read yeah. it. I've read it. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm aware. not surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised. But then you're remembering that first part, huh, where he's yes, talking yes. about that and how um, how he just lived in a in a totally other world for a few years, sitting on park benches and uh, yeah, just and it just became normal after that. Then <laughs> yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, it's but you know that's all part of this broader conversation we're having, right? And we could see this what could be coming down as a as a huge trial for humanity and a huge opportunity for us to move from unconscious to conscious in the sense that an Eckhart Tolle might talk about that, uh, the words that he might use for that, to wake up, to wake up. Would be a very good thing. I think it would, I think it, it would be a very good thing for us. And ultimately, that's what we all want. Deep Absolutely. down, that's what we Absolutely. want. That's why Absolutely. we do all these things. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think we've just gotten off track. We, we The more we, we moved into the last couple of centuries and so forth, or what, wherever you want to start, but I think we, I really, from what I've read, think that our ancestors, the indigenous peoples, were much more in tune with that, you know, just as a part of the, the way that they, they lived on this planet. And, and so <clears throat> probably much more experience, peace and joy and these things. And I think Ultimately, that is what we all want. We've just, it's like with ultra processed foods that have hijacked, hijacked our, our nutrition. You know, we, we, we've forgotten, we've forgotten how to get what we really want, right? <clears throat> Go to the supermarket, you shop and buy all the ultra processed food, not what your body really wants and needs. You get hooked in this doing, doing, doing society, not really what your body wants and needs, but you, we forget, right? We forget what what it is that that we really, and forget maybe forget the path back. What's the path back? And I think that's what you're trying to do with these podcasts. So how do we move? How do we? What's the path back? And the beauties of that path back. Yeah, and I think that. The only way we're going to do that is if we want to do it in the first place, if we see the necessity of this, if we see the urgency of this, if we have the interest in this, because where there's interest, you're going to learn about it. You're going to explore it. You're going to want to understand our, our destructive ways. And out of that understanding, perhaps there will be a clarity. I think, I think so. I think so. And that's where the trials can transform. Huh? The trials mm. can change our focus, can <clears throat> help us to shift our focus and then to 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 have have a think about it, and then move as the way you just articulated so nicely. Move in the move, wake up, huh? In that sense, move towards wholeness. <laughs> yes, yeah, right, right. You know, in the broadest sense of the word, huh? That our our, our wholeness in, in our relationship with this planet and everything on it, and then with the transcendent as well, huh? That that all that is one one. One thing, huh? The, the unmanifest, the manifest, and the relationship, the deep relationship and connectedness between between those, huh? Wholeness, as you say, wholeness in that broadest sense. Because mm. you're right. I, I, <laughs> the beautiful thing about all of this is that, like, like we stated earlier, that we look at nature, what is nature? But ultimately, we are nature. Like we don't, exactly. we don't have to, we are nature. So it's, we are nature. That's right. And then the, 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 the realization is that nature is the transcendent or God or whatever you want to call yeah. it. It's no separation. We're one with all, we are that, 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 that Eastern, that, yeah, we, thou art that, we are that, we're that. We are that. We're with all of that. Yeah. And not just conceptually, like you can, you know, it's, right. it's it's much deeper than that. <laughs> That's right. And as you, you read Paul, and you may recall him saying, you know, you may have the belief that you're one with the transcendent, but when you have that enlightenment kind of experience, it moves from belief to a deep knowing, huh? It, it's, not, it's not just a belief anymore or a conceptual thing. It's at the deepest level, you know, that's that's it. Because it, it truly, like, I love the way we began this conversation with just exploring what is nature and sustainability, and we end up at this. But 
to me, it, it truly does seem to boil down to what we just discussed here in the last few minutes is that everything points to oneness. Even if we look at science, if we look at mathematics, if, if we look at the spiritual traditions, religions, everybody points to this oneness. And we can recognize that. We can understand what that is. And that's ultimately what we're looking for. Right. Our, our thread back to what we really are beyond names mm. and forms. Huh? And, mm. then, and then, as we said, to be able to have the time to enjoy being, being on this planet. It's so amazing, yeah. huh? I, and yeah. to become childlike. I mean, Jesus is, said, become childlike, huh? Mm. And I think that so much of just, I know when I retired, my wife and I moved to the backwoods of Colorado, way away from anything, 12 miles in on a gravel road, just living there in the nature. And I thought, I don't want to study anything anymore. I don't want to think about any of that. I simply want to be like I was when I was a little boy. And everything was just amazing to me. Every single thing that I looked at was amazing. I wanted to become a child again. And I think that. Huh? And Nisargadatta talks a lot. When the seekers would come that wanted to become enlightened, he talks a lot about that he would tell them go back to when you were a child go back to when you're a child and some would come and say well you know in my religion they talk or in this way they talk that he said forget all that forget all that i want to hear about that what's in you what's in you go back to that time you were a child go back to before you were here's the cultural inflection before you were taught all these different things right all that's culturally inflected and not to say that that's bad, you need to have, as we talked in this conversation, you need to have some of that to know how to live in an environment, right? And it's going to be, that's really critical. But to realize, hey, that's just a momentary inflection in time and space, change the time and space and put me there and I'm a different, I'm a different Fred, right? Or a different Tom. It's, it's culturally inflected. So don't get too hung up on that to realize that ultimately we're, we're all the same, one one with the transcendent. We're we're one with that. And it's a beautiful thing, I think. And I guess that's our whole task then, right? To understand that, to understand what thinking is, to understand how thinking limits us, creates identities, creates division. And if we understood what thinking is, perhaps we'll realize what. Well, Right. All no, this I, is. <laughs> yes, no. And that, that would be moving from unconscious to conscious, right? Mm. From, from kind of unconsciously going through, this is what I was trained to be. This is the way it is, by golly, rigid as can be, to to opening up to, to all of that that you were talking about. Huh? And then to realize that uh, what we kill one another over is simply a cultural inflection in the blink of an eye here on on this planet and you know it seems like if we want to continue to be a species in the garden of in this garden garden of eden so to speak we, we're going to need to do some the things that we're talking about it seems like to me anyway uh, at some of these you know we're in the sixth mass extinction that's happening we know that um so five other ones, life isn't going to go away on this planet, but homo sapiens could. I mean, they, uh, people who study these things tell us that 99.9% .9 of the species that have been here on this planet are gone now. huh? So they're, they're coming and going and coming and going. No reason to think that, that we necessarily unique in that sense, right? But I think with this transcending boundaries and learning to love uh, is a huge challenge for humans in terms of it. It could sound, oh, yeah, learning to love. But in terms of how we start to build communities that are, are inclusive and uh, that learn how to deal with these challenges that are coming down. So I, I don't see love as trivial. I see that as, as the key. It's very practical. To, yes, it's very practical. That's... I get a kick out of you, Dom. Really, you, the, you, 
you're thinking a lot about all these, but that's what I used to think. That's not some esoteric kind of, it's practical. It's practical. Be. That's, that's, yeah. it's as practical as it can be. If, and, and <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's a word I used to use too a lot. It's a very practical thing. Gosh, Fred, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. Too, you have, we, we I don't know what else to. No, it's perfect. It's a good time to to to. I don't want to say end, but to let let go for now. And I want to keep in touch with you. Really, I'm so happy that that we could get together. And uh, I'm not saying this to simply to be patronizing or anything at all. But I I, just, I think what you're wanting to do and what you're what you've thought about, what you're thinking about, what you're trying to do. To me, it's fabulous. It, it it makes hope spring in my heart. You know, it makes hope spring in my heart. I can't help it. I, I'm I, I'm obsessed with this stuff. This is all I do. <laughs> yeah, it's what you love. You're it's what I love. Heart. It's what You're I love. Your heart, and your heart to me is is in a place that's that's so valuable for for our species at this point. I, I really think that you know, and I, I hope that's not being egotistical in any way or not or presumptive or whatever words we would use but it just seems like to me that this this is really what matters nowadays what you're doing what we're talking about i think uh, and that's what i'm trying to articulate in those three papers for that veterinary journal uh is just what we're talking about here too you know it's those kind of things that uh because I feel like deep down, that's what we all truly want to understand. It's just that maybe not all of us have the opportunity to explore these things. And I was very lucky. I had the opportunity to explore these things. And perhaps that's why I'm speaking about these things at all. But I think deep down, that's what we're truly, if we truly asked ourselves these questions, we would all arrive at the same place, at the same questioning, at the same reasoning. And it's just like some of us, I, I felt lucky. I feel somewhat responsible because I had the time. I had the the leisure you could say to to think about these things and that's you know and oh yeah, i agree i, I can't agree. help it I, <laughs> I sure think you're right and i think where, where we can get hung up is that you know the the world's different religions mythologies which are amazing including the the what we'd call quote the primitive mm. ones the political situation the political structures that we create I think in a way that they would all ideally be to to take us to that place that you're talking about, right? To what to what we all want. But they they can ease so easily become hijacked, huh? For for other other motives, power, greed, those kinds mm. of things that 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 can can hijack it. And I think often that's what what happens with it, huh? Rather than moving toward toward this ultimate realization of, of kind of our, our brief moment in the manifest in this amazingly beautiful garden of Eden here. And then that ultimately there's a wholeness that we're one with the transcendent and with all of this. And, and that the deep, deep peace that comes from that enlightenment I don't see that as something that gets talked about much in the religions as I experienced them or in the in the politics as I'm experiencing. And nowadays, you know, it's it's more about the divisiveness, which belief system do you have versus this, versus that, versus the other. Um, and I, I see that as just totally defeating of 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 really this this ultimate wholeness and, and what we're talking about here. So how do we wake up to that? You know, how do we wake up to that? And conversations like this are a way to to start some of that. Huh? Start people it's a thinking start, that yeah. class that I was teaching was meant totally for that. That's what it wasn't about. Now I'm going to tell you a bunch of stuff and you're going to write it back on an exam. It was about what we're talking about. You know, that's what I came to the realization is uh, this is what needs to this is what needs to happen. We need to to be engaging one another in these really wonderful wonderful dialogues about issues of the day and 
and it went to spiritual parts as well in there. And, you know, I was at a university that was and in a state that was very strongly Mormon, the Mormon belief system. And so they're trained in it. It's it's that's a very strong inflection in that sense. But it was amazing the conversations we would have about in this broader sense of what what that's where that's meant to take you to this this sense of peace and joy and uh ability to to live in in the world in ways that uh, that try to 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 do the best we can for all life on this planet one another and all all life on the planet and ultimately it's for our own benefit that we do that i used to yeah. i used to often <laughs> say you know really i used to say to students you know if you want to be selfish if you really want to be selfish do nice things for other people just all day long, do nice things for other people because it'll come back to you so much you won't be able to believe it. You know, it's it's a different way to say on selfish, right? It's it, and it's it makes you that connection with everything you feel that so deeply that you just feel and it's taking you back to what you're you're talking about, huh? what we all want. What is it that we all want? Mm -hmm. That's the question. What is it that we all want? Yeah. And I think we've been talking about it too, huh? And it's not mm. all the the materialistic doing, doing, doing things. It's it's these other, um, all the other uh, things that we've been talking about uh, throughout this conversation, I think in such nice ways. Well, look, Fred, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, same for me, Dom. Same for me. Honest to goodness, I... Uh, it was absolutely a pleasure. It's it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to see you. I want to keep in touch with you. Yeah, we'll keep I'll in touch. I'll send you a couple but... <laughs> of things. I'll send you a couple of things. Oh, and actually, um, where can people find you, your work? Where's the best pay, place for people to go? You know, <clears throat> I don't know nowadays where, where um, you know, I, I wrote the book Nourishment. I did an audio book version of that audiobook adaptation where I tried to strip out a bunch of the detail that came out just last um, last fall that that gives overviews of of really the kind of things that we're talking about here mm -hmm. and, and I would say if people were interested probably that audiobook is a good way because people like to get information that way nowadays easy to listen uh, some of the detail that that was in nourishment um, <clears throat> was stripped out of that. So it's not as, uh, you know, if you're totally passionate about all this and really want to learn more, the book is the best way. <laughs> but but um, if you, you want just the big picture, that that audio book adaptation is really, really a good way. And, uh, you know, I've been lots of talks and podcasts for sure over the years. I don't keep, you know, when I left the university, I, I decided I don't want, I don't want to be on social medias. I don't want to, I want time. I just want time, time to mm -hmm. think, time to, time to reflect. <laughs> so I, I don't, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't, we had a, a, a wonderful web page. Uh, two ladies uh, put that web page together that, that was there for, for, it may still be up, behave was the name of it, behave. But um, one lady moved on to other other kinds of work. The other lady retired that were involved in that. Kathy Both and Beth Burrett were the two. And uh, so I don't know if that website is still be, being kept up the way that, that Beth had done that over the years. But I decided not to put up web page and those things. It, it's, it relates to what we were talking about. You can get so subsumed in in keeping up with all of those things that you don't have time anymore to, to just, just to be, to just be. So, and I'm not saying those are bad. I'm not, they, they do a lot of good, but for me personally, at that point in the game, it was about trying to step back and have time, time as my colleague and skiing friend was saying, I, I just need, I feel so much. I need time to think now. I just need time to reflect and think, you know, and, uh, well, you're going to get it when you retire in a couple of years. You'll have a lot of time. He's ready for that, you know, to go to the forest, as the Hindus would say, huh? And then to try to become enlightened. So, yeah, so those would be ways, I think. And then I, uh, 
yeah, those would probably be the best ways. Great. Well, look, I'll link all of these in the in the in the show notes and well, wherever I can. And yeah, um, any other final thoughts, comments? Mm, no, I, I just <laughs> appreciate the opportunity to have been with you, Dom. And I'll send you a couple of things that you can link in with the show notes mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that help. And yeah, I would love to stay in touch with you, though. I it's wonderful to 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 meet you, to see what you're doing with this, to see. I, you have to keep me informed of your experience on the organic farms. Where will that be? Where you are now? Or in Portugal, yeah, in the in, in Faro Faro region, the southern part of Portugal. Uh, maybe I'll exactly. do more, but at the moment, I just want to explore that. <laughs> yes, you have to keep me informed of that, Dom, as your time as your time permits. I'm serious about that. No, I'm absolutely, serious. absolutely, absolutely. It's it's part of the your journey in that. It's part of the. It, there's a website called www.oof.net. It's a, like a worldwide organic, worldwide organic association where there's different countries and farmers can just post their farm and people can just volunteer to work there. So that's the that's the organization that I'll, I'll okay. be doing. It. I'll yeah. look it up. I'll look it up. <laughs> okay, Dom. Well, listen. Wonderful to visit with you. Yeah, wonderful speaking to you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. I'll look forward to keeping in touch. <laughs> thank you so much.